Good day, I'm Mark Kulich from Electrical and Computer Engineering, and uh, we'll start now the next round of talks with uh, uh, starting with the exciting work in uh, calcium imaging uh, from Daniel Akaroni, who is the assistant professor in the neurology department. He was a postdoc here at UCLA and was doing so well that we could not let him go. So without further ado, Daniel, please. Um, uh, so I'm interested in what I like to think of as research-driven tool design. Um, my background, I was actually here for undergrad, graduate school, postdoc, and now I'm faculty here. My background initially was in experimental particle physics. And oftentimes in particle physics, there isn't a clear division across labs and people of who uh, are interested in initially conceiving of a scientific question the people that develop models or simulations to understand what needs to go into the tool development to ask those questions, people that collect the data, and the people that analyze it. Oftentimes, that's all kind of grouped into the same people. And I think to do really good research, oftentimes you need to understand all those aspects. Um, and so for my talk today, I'll be talking about this project started as a postdoc, and now I continue on in my own lab along with collaboration across many labs here at UCLA to develop tools that enable researchers to ask and hopefully answer novel questions in their field. Um, this often works with me working in very close collaboration with researchers to identify constraints and requirements of interest that they have and, and identifying why those, the interests and the questions have not been asked yet. And then working alongside them to develop uh, the tools, be it hardware, software, computational tools, surgical or experimental protocols um, to get experiments working and to get scientific results um, out of those labs. Um, along with that, I'm motivated to make systems that don't just benefit me or collaborators, but that can benefit the whole neuroscience community. That a lab on the other side of the world that we've never talked to can take what we've developed, build it in their lab, and get up and running um, collecting data on their own. And then my other motivation is um, working with the brain is extremely difficult. It's a squishy system. The science, is all while people have been doing neuroscience for decades, is still also sort of this squishy science. And um, dealing with tools that aren't perfect for the questions you want to ask just make that that much more difficult. Um, so um, I would like to kind of build tools that really empower researchers to ask the specific questions they want instead of designing their questions around the hardware that's available to them. Um, and so I put up here a list of capabilities a neuroscientist might want when recording neural activity from an animal. Um, so it's not a complete list, but you might want to be able to get neural activity from single neurons. You might want to be able to record activity from not just one neuron, but a bunch of neurons simultaneously. Maybe you want to do this in freely behaving animals. Um, so there's uh, electrical appro approaches, which I think uh, after the break we'll hear from Satiris. This is one of his silicon probes that has a bunch of electrical uh, electrode sites that can implant it into the brain. And with a setup like this, you can record neural activity uh, from single cells. In mice, you can maybe collect activity from tens of cells simultaneously, often in a freely behaving animal. But uh, the activity from a cell you saw in one recording session, it's hard if not impossible to say that the activity you saw even five hours later is that coming from that same cell. There are also a handful of optical te techniques. In neuroscience, most of these are two-photon and confocal microscopy, um, sometimes wide field fluorescent imaging. And outside of a few exceptions, if you wanted to do this sort of imaging in um, an awake animal, you're really limited to a head fixed prep. So you cement a, a steel bar onto the skull of the animal and you fix them underneath a large tabletop microscope like this. Um, conveniently, there's an open spot in the middle of this chart where our project fits in. Um, we design miniature fluorescent microscopes that can be worn on the head of a mouse. They're about three grams um, in, in weight and allow us to record neural activity from individual neurons across hundreds of neurons simultaneously while the animals are awake and freely be, be, uh, behaving, performing behavioral tasks in um, an array of different um, environmental uh, environments. Um, since we haven't seen any direct imaging of neural activity, I have a, yet today, I have a quick animation of sort of how this imaging works. Um, so for a second, forget we're talking about a microscope sitting on top of a mouse's head. Instead, we just have a slice of brain tissue that we have modified 
um, genetically modified some neurons to express a fluorescent protein when they're active. So here I have six cells that um, are able to fluoresce a protein, which for the imaging I'll show in my talk, we're usually looking at something called GCAM6. Um, and so this slice of tissue sitting underneath the microscope, uh, we have an objective that shines blue excitation light that illuminates the tissue underneath our microscope. Cells that are expressing this fluorescent protein that are active and underneath the excitation light will fluoresce. That green light travels back up through the tissue, through the optics of our microscope, and forms an image on a camera. And in this case, it might look like this. We have a uh, focal plane. Um, cells on or near that focal plane will be rather in focus and crisp. But we do collect fluorescence out of that focal plane as well. As we image deeper through tissue, that green fluorescent light scatters more through the tissue, and that really limits um, how deep we can image. Generally, for a system like this, we can image about up to 300 micrometers deep through tissue before the scattering degrades our spatial resolution and can no longer make out cell bodies um, fluorescing. Um, so that brings us to, to our microscope. Our project, which has now been around, we started, I think, five years ago when it began my pro postdoc. I like to think of it as having two major components. One's the system itself that we designed. It consists of a head-mounted fluorescent microscope connected to custom data acquisition uh, hardware through a thin, flexible coaxial cable. And that miniscope system can connect to a computer over USB, and then it can be synchronized with other external equipment, like a behavioral camera or other hardware you have that um, is useful in the experiment. But along with the system, we've spent a lot of time developing a resource that's built around this website, miniscope.org, um, that allows us to take our developments and te techniques and share them with the neuroscience community. Um, for the amount of time we put in just to building the system and making it work in our hands and at UCLA, we probably spent just that, that same amount of time taking the system and finding all the little bugs and tweaks so that a lab, anywhere in the world, can kind of go to our website, follow our partless tutorials, our video tutorials on this assembly, and get up and running with the system. Along with the majority of labs that just want to use a technique like this, there are also some that want to develop on top of it. And so we provide all the work we've done in terms of source codes and schematic layouts to enable those researchers to take what we've developed so far as like a built stepping off point and then take this technology and innovate on top of it. Um, just to kind of promote our like open source science, it's, we have open kind of access to our, our, our project two and a half years ago. Since then, over 400 labs, uh, neuroscience labs around the world have built uh, close to about 2,000 of our mini scopes, almost all without our invo involvement at all. We also run two-day workshops um, here on campus as well as um, internationally to kind of train researchers in, in how to use the system, how to collect data, <coughs> how to do surgeries, and how to analyze um, the system. Um, and so this is our microscope. It's about three grams sitting on the head uh, of a mouse. Um, Gives us a field of view right now about 700 by 400 micrometers. Depending on what brain region we're imaging, in this case we're looking at the CA1 layer of hippocampus, we can consistently record four to 600 active neurons day after day with the system. Um, as I mentioned, due to scattering of tissue, it really limits how deep we can image through tissue, about 300 micrometers. And working alongside the, uh, a bunch of researchers using the system as we were developing it, there's a bunch of features that um, really make a system like this robust and usable for neuroscientists. Though there's so much work involved in training animals, getting your surgeries working, you don't want to have to deal with additional hardware issues to actually get an animal to run to perform the task. And we put a lot of effort into making a system where neuroscientists don't have to worry about it working well. And oftentimes people are interested at the cost, but compared to like the most comparable commercial system that's similar to this, our microscopes can be built for about two orders of magnitude cheaper than what's available commercially. And while I'm somewhat partial, or I think our system is substantially better than anything commercially available. The, the general workflow to get imaging working is, uh, let's say we want to image in the CA1 layer of hippocampus. So this is just a, a picture of um, a cross-section of a mouse brain. We first inject um, a virus that will um, allow cells to express this fluorescent protein. We then come ba back and implant a special type of lens called a gradient index of refraction lens. It's a glass cylinder that's gone through a bunch of uh, manufacturing processes to give us similar um, optics to what you would see from just an objective lens in a microscope. 
we can implant that lens right on the surface of the brain if we want to image cortex, or in the case of hippocampus in a mouse, we have to aspirate cortex, and we plant it about a millimeter and a half deep. Um, and so that bottom of the lens is just going to sit within a few hundred micrometers of the cells we want to image. Um, that lens gets cemented to the skull, as well as a, a small aluminum base plate. And that's all that's permanently affixed to the animal. When we want to come and image, our microscope snaps onto their base plate with a few uh, alignment magnets and a set screw, and then you're off and reporting. If you open up our microscope, um, you really would see what you'd expect to see in a, wide, a tabletop wide field fluorescent microscope. Uh, everything's just smaller and lighter. Our excitation light source, instead of being a laser or a lamp, is a super bright surface mount uh, excitation LED. Um, that goes through some optical filters uh, down our objective grin lens and illuminates the tissue. Uh, green fluorescent light travels back up through some filters and is focused onto a custom image sensor circuit board with a camera at the top of our microscope. Now, if we weren't dealing with scattering of fluorescence um, in tissue, we get really nice spatial resolution. So our spatial resolution, even though our optics are very small, give us about a one and a half micron spatial resolution. But the moment we image through tens of micrometers of tissue, um, that resolution starts to degrade. Our system then connects to um, data acquisition hardware that's sitting somewhere in your experimental room. That generally would require a couple lines for power, for a couple lines for communication, some lines for data transfer. Spent a, our first version had a bunch of cables coming off of it. The current Miniscope does all this through a single one millimeter diameter coaxial cable that we can get down to also 0.3 millimeters. Uh, we found that uh, animal behavior is mostly affected by the flexibility and how lightweight the cabling is coming off the animal's head and not so much the weight of the microscope. And so this has significantly improved a lot of um, behavioral tasks that people uh, use with the microscope. When we put this all together, uh, we get something like this. This is a, a mouse running back and forth on a two meter linear track wearing the miniscope. Uh, we're collecting monochromatic green fluorescent light. Once we've gone through some analysis to uh, correct any brain motion that we, we, when we're imaging, to identify neurons and extract neural activity, we can generate this video we're seeing um, in the bottom right that it's just artificially colored different neurons that we've detected um, in different colors. And then out of those about 500 neurons that we see flashing, on the right is an example of 50 of their fluorescent activity or a measure of their neural activity as the animals performing this task on a linear track. Um, with the system, it's one very powerful aspect of it is that we can get that recording on day one, uh, we get the recording on day two or day 14 or 30, and we've done this across uh, actually multiple months. Every day we come back, we can collect um, kind of an average frame, which has some nice landmarks. In this case, we can see a nice blood vessel. Um, we can then offline match up the recording sessions uh, from day one to day 40, 14 to day 30, and then through some simple algorithms, say, say a cell we saw on day one, with a high level of confidence, we can say that that same cell showed up in day two. And so now we can do these longitudinal studies uh, looking at how uh, neural activity changes across time. Um, we'll just get that. And so I was showing some recordings in hippocampus. Um, since then, in our labs, as well as through collaborators, we've hit a bunch of other brain regions. Generally, um, the, when a, a neuroscientist collects data for the first time and we see any flashes, they send it to me and so I generate another video and put it on the slide. Um, but we can hit a bunch of deep brain regions as well as a bunch of um, superficial um, regions with this technology. So that's the base Miniscope system. Um, we wanted to build it to collect data in our own labs. We wanted to build something that any neuroscientist science lab could use. We also wanted to use it as a, a platform for innovation. So in my last minute or two, I'll quickly show some of the ongoing projects now um, where we're taking this technology and really pushing it forward to enable new types of um, research that could be done. So one is to incorporate optogenetic stimulation along with miniscope imaging. In this case, instead of imaging green fluorescence, we're imaging red fluorescence in hippocampus, which would be coupled with blue excited auxins. Um, we have systems that allow us to image multiple wavelengths simultaneously, so you can target two different cell populations simultaneously or, or image them sequentially. Um, we have added uh, microfluidic drug delivery to the system. We recently published a paper in collaboration with Ali Pasha Vaziri's lab, um, turning the microscope into a light field microscope. This ends up allowing us to image volumes of tissue underneath our lens at video frame rate. So we can image a whole volume of hippocampus, let's say, um, at 30 frames or 60 frames per second. Um, we'll skip over this and 
I'll talk about the two main projects quickly. So one, um, we spent a lot of time making the cabling that comes off the animal's head lightweight and flexible. Um, but we wanted to go one step further. There's a lot of experiments we wanted to do that just really didn't work with the cabling. So let's say a very large, exper uh, large environment where you just can't, the mouse can't drag a cable back and forth. In that case, we designed new electronics um, that are extremely power efficient, um, that incorporate imaging, data acquisition, and storage all onto the head of the animal that is battery powered and log data to an SD card. Um, I'll skip over a pilot experiment. So one thing we can do now this was data recorded in Piemont Galshani's lab here at UCLA is a mouse running back and forth on a 25 foot long linear track wearing our wire free scope with our imaging of 500 or so neurons um, with some of the neural activity. Something that could not have been done before a technology like this. Now we can come back day after day and track how these neurons uh, change their activity um, as animals running back and forth. Um, one other uh, project we are just finishing up our first year of a five year NSF grant with the collaboration of a bunch of people here at UCLA is to incorporate uh, electrophysiology alongside our calcium imaging. Um, so this is taking the base miniscope system, developing this green EFIS PC board that attaches to the top of the microscope. Um, we right now have a, uh, our first 32 channel system that can record 32 channels of EFIS data while recording our calcium imaging. Um, and I'll show, uh, this is, the first recording taken from Tadler's lab about two weeks ago in a rat. We're imaging hippocampus on, on one hemisphere, and then we're recording EFIS uh, in the other hemisphere in the CA1 layer. Uh, this is not nearly the best imaging in rats Tad has done, or the best uh, EFIS recording, but this is the first animal ever implanted to do both, and it, and it works pretty well. So you can see oscillations in hippocampus, theta oscillations as well as gamma, um, as well as some other signals um, on the EFIS system. And then, I'll just skip over all this, and we're just also starting a, a project to expand the miniscope from its current field of view to a much smaller, lighter system that has three times the field of view, and then collaboration with Michelle Basso, we just starting a brain initiative grant to make bigger microscopes for non-human primates that should allow us to image uh, up to like 10,000 active neurons in an awake, freely behaving animal, um, either uh, all wireless, either wire-free or, or uh, streaming. So we have a bunch of fun projects going on. Um, it's really driven by the research questions. So while we're solving a bunch of engineering problems along the way, um, every choice we make is to really address uh, a challenge or hurdle that neuroscientists face and to build a system that really works well um, in, in a neuroscientist's hand and doesn't require engineers being around to make sure something works. I, I just mentioned really quickly, the work started uh, when I was a postdoc and joined Paymon Alcino and Balgi Cox Lab here at UCLA, and a lot of the initial development was um, done really in really close work with Denise and Tristan, who were postdocs at the time, and are now uh, faculty at Mount Sinai. Okay, great. If, if this time for questions. Uh, is there questions? Oh, clear. Uh, I'm how long can you really, like, did you talk about long-term longevity of some of these? So, um, right now, we, the, the limiting factor for most of the recordings most people do is um, the viral expression of G camps slowly making cells toxic and sick and killing them. So, um, when we're careful, we can get very nice recordings for a month and a half to two months before we start to see the dynamics of these cells really change and cells sort of dying out but they're now transgenic mice lines that don't have this issue of overexpression. And there we should be able to record for a year. 